I'm Irene Pease, your friendly neighborhood astronomer. This is our little Thursday evening stroll around our celestial neighborhood. Definitely needed to get out out of town, some fresh air, some fresh space uh, this weekend. So I hope everyone is having a fun and safe holiday weekend. Um, I know I am here in Brooklyn. So tonight uh, is going to be hopefully a part one of... Uh, stellar streams. I really wanted to talk about stellar streams. I also wanted to be able to look at stellar streams. That's still in the works. So for tonight, we're going to talk about it and show some things. Um, but first, we'll pop over and check out our night skies for the week using Stellarium. And then we'll be back to open space in just a little bit. So in Stellarium, we can see our night sky as it is now, the glorious, beautiful skies of Brooklyn, New York. And of course, over in the west, there's a tree and uh, <laughs> some planets have sunk below the horizon. Ah, missed them. So I think it's cloudy out anyway. But um, if you were out earlier, you may have seen Jupiter and Saturn. So you'll have to be kind of quick about catching those just after sunset over the next month or so. As I have probably mentioned about every week or so, they're going to get closer and closer together. And next month on December 21st, they're going to be super, super, duper close, closest they've been in almost 400 years. So that'll definitely be something to look for. So let me just take us back to a little bit before sunsets. Yeah, back in time, things we can do with Stellarium. Wonderful. So a little bit before sunset, they're kind of high. Uh, well, not actually not that high. I think they're around like 30, 40 degrees off of the south, southwest horizon. And then as we run through time, as the sky gets darker, um, they really pop out, but they're getting low. So to catch them, you want to be somewhere where you can see pretty close to the horizon towards the southwest. And as they sink, 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 sink uh, towards the horizon, um, they get harder and harder to, to find. So there might be buildings or trees or whatever stuff, you know, life in the way, but definitely worth checking out. So get yourself familiar with those. If you haven't been watching them, Jupiter's quite bright. Saturn is a little bit, uh, quite a bit actually fainter, but Saturn, uh, Jupiter is definitely the brightest thing over in that part of the sky. So we'll be watching those over the next few weeks yet. Um, also, tonight we have the moon just past Mars, and I actually kind of want to follow the moon through this week. Uh, it's going to be moving past Uranus, which you won't really see because it's really hard to see without a telescope or binoculars. Moving, moving, booking along until it's new. It goes right past this little cluster here, the Pleiades, past the Hyades. We saw both of those last week from a slightly different perspective, talking about moving groups of stars, which is kind of related to what we're talking about tonight. So I thought I'd point those out again. And also kind of taking us over towards the next constellation. So this is kind of building up towards looking at a particular star, but if we kind of review from last week, we saw Cassiopeia. So those big jaws up there, om nom nom and nom om nom. And if you follow kind of the, <laughs> the, the lower part, uh, uh, nom om nom, uh, down towards the moon or towards the Pleiades, right between them is this group of stars in here that's uh, the constellation Perseus. So stick figure, yeah. Uh, that almost looks like a walking thing because these almost look like feet. I don't know. I always see it as kind of like a giant witch's hat. So like a curve along here, like the eastern curve and then a western curve, like a big pointy hat. Um, it's supposed to be a guy with a shield and a dead head. Um, more on that head next week. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's Perseus, the Greek hero, or the witch's hat. Let's just go with witch's hat, right? So if you can find Cassiopeia, that M or W shape, depending on like if you're standing on your head or not, um, follow that down towards the Pleiades, basically between the W and that Pleiades cluster is where you'll find Perseus. So go ahead and see if you can make out those two separate uh, strips of stars, the kind of eastern side of the witch's hat and the western side of the witch's hat. And if you have um, enough eggnog, maybe you can imagine a Greek hero with a shield and some dead Gorgon's head. Right. 
So that's what you're looking for this week. Find Perseus in all its glory, and we'll check back in on that next week. So that's Solarium, and we're going to pop back on over to Open Space. Oh, Open Space. So Open Space, again, this is uh, open source software that you can download for free at openspaceproject.com. And you can basically fly around the universe in 3D, which is what I'm going to do. At least I'm going to try. Part of the universe. And... Um, <laughs> And uh, we're going to uh, actually be looking at real data. So that's the fun thing about open space is where you just load a whole bunch of data in. It's A lot of it is the Digital Universe Atlas, which is curated at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, but we have other data from other sources. And I actually want to check out one of those sources. Um, so the the lines, before I say much more, like I said, this is all real data. So there aren't really these giant lines out in space. So these lines are representing the orbits of the planets. I normally start off a little bit closer to Earth, but I was having Facebook issues. And so <laughs> we started off kind of out helter-skelter in, in the solar system. Um, so what I want to do is actually bring us around. So that blue line there, that's, that's the orbit of Earth. And we're going to come near, but not quite all the way to the Earth. So we're zipping around here. I'm gonna look kind of, if we were looking down, hope I'm not making anyone nauseous here, flying around so quickly through space. Um, but we're gonna come in here and actually focus on a wonderful, wonderful satellite. I think we're focused. Yeah, we're focused on. Wonderful, wonderful satellite. Um, so way out, far away from the earth. So you can see, see if I tilt up so you can see where the sun is. Yep, there's the sun. Um, so you can see the orbit of Mercury over here. Here's the orbit of Venus coming along here. And you might even be able to see like there's a little maybe, circle kind of going around there. That's the orbit of the moon uh, visualized nicely for us because again, these lines aren't really out in space. Um, but what I want to see is... Uh, is this mission and I want to turn on the trail for it yeah so what kind of trail is that it's like we have a stalker wow it's neat so this is a trail for the space telescope Gaia which is an uh, European Space Agency um, I think it's the ESO uh, European Space Observatory um, telescope that's way out here way beyond the orbit of the moon at what we call L2. So this is one of the Lagrange points. It's a point of gravitational stability along the Earth-Sun line. So it's the point that is along the line between the Earth and the Sun, along a line that connects the Earth and the Sun that's out past the Earth. So that's the point we call L2. And that whoosh, is Gaia. Well, it's our model of Gaia. So I can turn off the, the trail, I guess. Um, so this is just a huge satellite that lives out there uh, past the way out uh, facing away from the sun, basically, so that uh, so it can look out into space. And Gaia has been mapping the stars. It's it's plotted positions for about one point seven billion. That's billion with a B stars. Uh, the next data release, uh, data release three, I believe, is coming up soon much anticipated so the first two data releases have um, have produced just a tremendous amount of research data um, just all kinds of really cool <laughs> visuals and uh, we actually have open space has the Gaia data in it but it does not play well with Macs and since I'm on a Mac um, I can't show you all of it in its glory but I'm working on it so this is going to be part one and I will make something work for part two so I just wanted to point out uh, Gaia because we are going to be looking at a bunch of data and be talking about some things that are based on Gaia data and all its wonderfulness. So uh, one of the first things I wanted to kind of look towards, if I can turn on some constellations and help me find my way around here. Um, and we are looking towards part of the sky that we can't really see from the northern hemisphere, but parts that we would see in the southern hemisphere. 
So I turn on these constellations, um, may not be able to see those super well, but mainly they're there for markers. So I can help myself navigate. Um, so if you're seeing some of these stick figures and they don't look too familiar, that's cool. If you live in the Northern Hemisphere, you have an excuse. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere, not so much. All right, so you see these fuzzy spots. So those are the uh, large and small Magellanic clouds as seen from Earth. And over yonder somewheres, I'm probably gonna get it wrong, but I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna wave my hands and say somewhere over here <laughs> is uh, Omega Centauri, uh, uh, the largest globular cluster in our sky. It's one of the closer globular clusters to us. And I'm going to talk about what that is and what in the world does all this stuff have to do with stellar streams, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about, right? Right. So to start off talking about stellar streams, I wanted to point out the large and small clouds uh, because we'll get there eventually. And then I want to go ahead and actually turn on the globular clusters. Oh, okay, I was close. It's a little off. I think it's over here. <laughs> and if we draw the labels, yeah, that's the one. Omega Centauri. Right, so Omega Centauri, big, bright. Um, I feel like we should be able to see it. Yeah, it's not really popping out. Okay, so that's where we're gonna go first. Uh, so we're gonna go out and try to see Omega Centauri. So we're gonna start moving out a bit away from uh, away from Earth, away from the solar system. Maybe a little bit faster. Turn on my friction and out we go. So goodbye Earth, goodbye solar system. And wow, so you can see how a lot of the, the nearby stars are very much just nearby, um, just kind of in our, our own little backyard here. Um, if we move out further and further, we can see kind of where we are uh, relative to uh, the rest of the galaxy, really. So you can see how these uh, these blobs, the globular clusters, are not necessarily in the plane of the galaxy like we are, like most of the stars are, uh, but a lot of them are uh, quite a bit above and below the plane. So last week when I talked mostly about moving groups, I also pointed out some open clusters um, so groups of rel relatively young groups of stars, you know, a few hundred, maybe a few thousand or so uh, stars that all form from the same big cloud of gas, the same stellar nursery. And so they have about the same age. They're all kind of moving through space together. So that's what makes them moving groups. And once those stars have formed, they are, you know, all kind of cluster together. So that that's what makes an open cluster. So sometimes those clusters drift apart a bit. And then we have more like these moving groups that are very loosely associated and not all clumped together in a relatively small volume of space that we can see and point our telescopes at and say, oh, wow, isn't that pretty and sparkly? So the other type of star cluster is this globular cluster. And again, Omega Centauri, really great. It's one of the uh, biggest, brightest ones, the brightest one, um, and close, one of the closest ones to us. Um, and it doesn't actually look like a, a yellow pentagon in the sky. <laughs> um, I think I actually have a picture. That's right. Yeah, it looks more like that. So this is an ESO image um, of Omega Centauri. So you kind of get a sense of, yeah, there's a lot of stars there. Um, Omega Centauri in particular has about 4 million-ish stars. It's 4 million solar masses, so 4 million times the mass of the sun. So if our sun is kind of an average star, then on average it should have eh, about 4 million stars in it, which is a lot, <laughs> right? Um, that's kind of a lot of stars. And it's almost like, you know, like a miniature galaxy. Um, and it turns out some of the globular clusters are theorized maybe they are cores of ancient galaxies that you know, interacted with our Milky Way, been more or less cannibalized and integrated into the Milky Way. So I've been learning a little bit more about the Milky Way's very turbulent past. Um, and so some people actually study, you know, what role globular clusters might have had in that because they are very, very old. So they're much larger than open clusters. Open clusters will be, you know, 
hundreds of light years across. Um, these are actually denser um, uh, yeah, these are actually quite a, quite a bit denser, um, and they have a lot more stars <laughs> in them. Um, so just a huge, huge cluster, almost like a, kind of like a miniature galaxy or the miniature core of a stripped galaxy. Um, but lots of, lots and lots of sparkles there, as you can see. So that's one of the biggest sparkliest ones, Omega Centauri. Um, and it's just kind of drifting up there, kind of a little bit above the plane of the galaxy. So not too terribly far away uh, right now. We're only, let's see, about six kiloparsecs, seven kiloparsecs. So you know, like 20,000 light years away from, uh, from Earth or from Gaia, <laughs> uh, since we're centered on Gaia. But this is one of the closer ones. And, um, and it's, it's, as you could tell, since it's above our off to the side of the plane, not so much above or below, but off of the plane. Um, and it is whirling and swirling and, and moving through the plane as it goes, similar to some stars. So um, another thing I can show to kind of demo that, instead of an actual stream, I have uh, some orbits of is just individual stars that I can pop into here. So the globular clusters are moving around the center of the galaxy, um, as are all the objects in the galaxy, are kind of whirling and swirling around, some in the plane, some not so much. So again, our sun is more or less in the plane, relatively well-behaved orbit. There it is, nope, very well-behaved. But some other stars are not as well-behaved, right? They're, you know, a little bit off, might be outside the plane, uh, definitely, you know, changing their distance from the center of the galaxy, which is fine. No harm in that. Not judging. Um, and there's some that are, this would be like more like a, um, an orbit of maybe one of the globular clusters. So we're just going to move out from here a little bit and see this star. So this is just a star. Again, this isn't actually an orbit of one of the globular clusters. Um, but you can imagine the, the globular clusters doing something similar where they actually pass through the plane and are kind of going around in and out of the plane. And as they pass through it, um, and even just as they're moving around it, they're getting kind of stripped apart a little bit. So that's what those stellar streams are, is basically just a stream of stars, both leading and lagging the globular clusters in their orbits around the galaxy. Um, so the Omega Centauri uh, um, actually has quite a stream off of it uh, that was... Hmm, I'm not seeing that now. I think they found a few hundred, like 300 some odd stars that were part of it using the Gaia data. So that's kind of a fun thing. Um, actually, I have a, another image in here. I think that's it. Yeah. Um, so this is, again, from Gaia. Uh, so ESA Gaia DPAC uh, image credit. <laughs> Um, of a bunch of stellar streams. So in the background, you see like a full spread of the galaxy. So it's all sky image of the galaxy going through there. You can see the large and small clouds. Um, and then these different colored strips are all bits of streams. So some of them kind of um, glob together, but again, we're just seeing a two dimensional uh, view of this. So putting these into open space and being able to fly around in 3D, we get a better perspective. Um, so I want to say one of these might actually be the Omega Sen, but could be off on that. Um, so a couple of the big ones that people have mapped out, this group, um, Men, uh, Mulhan et al., um, and Ibada, who I believe actually does a lot of studies of globular clusters. Um, so some that they've been able to tease out from the Gaia data by looking at how fast all these stars are moving and tell that they're all kind of going in the same general direction, which is pretty incredible. So it's a lot of power, uh, very powerful data set, 
and some very powerful computing <laughs> that these scientists are using to figure out which of the 1.7 billion stars uh, are about the same age and doing kind of the same thing, moving in the same general part uh, of the galaxy. So super cool. So if you look at all these globular clusters, 150-ish that we have uh, going around the galaxy, imagine a lot of those have streams. And some of them, again, might be parts of ancient galaxies, ancient dwarf galaxies that just kind of got gobbled up by ours. So we have, uh, we're finding more and more evidence of uh, ancient mergers um, and kind of uh, building the the family tree, so to speak, of the um, of the Milky Way galaxy. So a lot of folks are familiar with like the whole upcoming merger with Andromeda, um, our neighbor in space. Uh, but even just in our, you know, the last several billion years, um, in the last ten billion years or so, we've had mergers probably with several other galaxies, large and small, and maybe some of those have. Uh, have kind of stripped away the cores of very, very small dwarf galaxies that were colliding um, and left these cores that might be some of the globular clusters we see today, plus the streams going around them. Um, so I also wanted to point out the largest of all Magellanic clouds since I was talking about streams. Um, so some of those streams might be coming from kind of dead, defunct dwarf galaxies. Some are coming off of globular clusters. Um, and then there's also the Magellanic stream that's actually connecting these two so not just stars, but also a mess of gas um, in there between the large and small Magellanic clouds. So that's kind of a huge leap <laughs> out in space um, to have uh, to, to be connecting these two uh, not entirely on top of each other galaxies. So our little dwarf galaxies that are kind of interacting with each other, and you can see, um, or we've seen evidence of them kind of tugging on each other and tugging their... Uh, each other's mass kind of apart. Um, I did actually want to point out one other stream, forgot. So there was Omega Centauri, there was large and small clouds, and then I had one other stream that I was going to try to find. We'll see if I can actually find it in here um, from a globular cluster called Palomar 5. And definitely need the labels on. And I need the labels to be big in order to find this. Um, so somewhere on this side, if I make the clusters really bright and relatively big, find our globular clusters. Um, yeah. I need to get in a bit closer though. Um, so, oops, <laughs> that's too big. Um, so, <laughs> so Palomar 5 is a, a globular cluster that's pretty far out there. Um, it's always a little scary trying to find this on the fly. Um, so Palomar 1, Palomar 2, Palomar 5 was found like middle of the last century um, and then it was lost and then it was found again. So that was about the time that they actually started finding these stellar streams as well. Um, so Palomar 5 is, let me make sure I'm on the right side of the galaxy, nope, um, is just way out there and looking down from Palomar 5, you have like this huge stream that sticks out. Um, so the cluster itself um, is about 30,000 30, 30, solar masses. So it's not like a huge cluster, um, but it's out here somewhere. And um, wait, there we go. There we see Palomar 1. If you see Palomar 5, point to it. Just, yeah, point. <laughs> um, so it's so it's pretty far, it's pretty far out there. It's not huge, um, but it has a huge stream. So the cluster itself, again, about 30,000 
uh, solar masses, but the stream has about 5,000 solar masses. So that's a lot of stars. So we're talking on the order of about 5,000 stars, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. Uh, again, just kind of assuming that um, there we are, Palomar 5. Um, so it's way up here. So assuming that um, that our sun is kind of average, um, we can see, I just want to turn the rest of these down a little bit um, and kind of see the galaxy from the perspective of Palomar 5. So it is way up there, um, kind of towards the outer bit of the, of the galactic halo. So this one, I think, would be a really gorgeous stream. This is, it's basically at um, a furthest point in its, in its orbit around the galaxy, as far as, uh, as far as people have been able to tell by looking at the, the stars around it, its stream and everything. So it has a huge stream that would be going all along here. Um, stretching out again about 30,000 light years um, so that's a huge stream like pretty far off of the galactic plane much further out than than the orbits of these but basically a whole mess of stars that are out orbiting like that around our galaxy so we'll kind of turn these down <laughs> turn them off a little bit um, and come back into Yield Galaxy, our, our little corner here. So I like this, the concept of stellar streams because it sounds really beautiful and, and really it should be like a, like the stream of stars all kind of loosely associated, like a, like a massive moving group, but just kind of streaming around the galaxy, more like, more like the stream of debris that we get uh, from, um, from comets that cause our meteor showers. So can just almost imagine like that waterfall or that stream of, of stars uh, kind of cascading around the galaxy um, in these big halos. So hopefully in the near future, we'll have some of that data loaded in and be able to revisit and maybe fly through some of those streams. But in the meantime, I'm really thankful for everything we can do <laughs> with open space, thankful for health and all kinds of other, you know, all the things. Um, thankful for, you know, folks who can tune in to Facebook, even when I can't seem to access it. So again, I'm Irene Pease, just put up my credits here. Um, thanks to Stellarium, Stellarium in all its glory, you can download and use Stellarium, find that at stellarium.org and also open space, which you can find, download, use that, it's all free to use at openspaceproject.com. So thank you for joining me, uh, your friendly neighborhood astronomer, for this little stroll around our celestial neighborhood. I just want to wish everyone a clear skies, be safe out there, and wear a mask.